some others. Um, this is the final workshop today, and um, I'm just going to start my our presentation. Um, so welcome to workshop three. We're going to get right into it. Um, this is uh, our today's agenda. We think we hope it's going to be a short workshop. So um, the first item on our agenda is going to be cost estimating. The second item is um, business skills. Uh, the third is we're going to do a review of stage two evaluation. You guys should be about halfway through your uh, design process right now. And we want to review um, what is submitted and some of the deadlines um, by the end of what's due by the end of, um, uh, of May. And then we'll have discussions. So with us today is our special guest, Allison. Um, with um, her own consulting firm. Um, Allison used to be with the Altus Group, uh, which is a big um, company out of Canada. And her job, what she did was, uh, her professional job at the time was just cost estimating for large construction projects. So that's her specialty. And uh, we wanted to invite her just to talk to you today and give uh, an overview about cost estimating, which as you know, is a big uh, central part of this competition. So feel free to ask her any questions um, uh, today. And then if you have any follow-up questions, um, send us an email and we'll try to get them to her. Um, and then as you know, the, you know the rest of us. So you've met uh, Anthony, my colleague Frank, Emily, and of course, Lisa. And um, to finish off, we just have a few housekeeping items. So the April check-in, so this is the check-in number two, is scheduled between April 12th and the 23rd. I think about only two or three teams have um, booked their times so far. So here's the link for that check-in. Please visit this link. And if you want to talk to us one-on-one -on -one, um, about your design, uh, then you, that's your chance to do that. And um, we've also completed the last series of videos for the Building 101 series. So the topics cover building your business plan, um, land purchasing versus leasing, structuring contracts, and then bonding, liens, and insurance. And you know these are some items that you don't necessarily have to know about as part of this competition because we will be taking care of those aspects for you. But for those who are curious about the business side of it, um, we develop these videos just so that you can um, be better informed about, about this. So um, with that, we want to start the conference today by asking some questions. So I'm going to queue it over to Lisa, um, and she has some poll questions to start everyone off. I just wanted to know where you're, you guys are at. So there are six questions there. Um, what's your team's progress on design for the small building and the big building? Um, are you 25% complete, almost done? Um, what's your progress on estimating costs? Um, I think that will help us talk about uh, in today's session to understand where you're at. Um, do you feel like you're just getting started or almost done? Um, next question is, where do you need help estimating costs? So do you, is it, you know, materials, labor, equipment, transportation and logistics, manufacturing, or if you need help in other areas, please let us know and that will inform our discussion today. <clears throat> and then uh, last two questions are, how do you feel about you know, uh, the deadline so far, the deadline to submit, uh, make final submissions on May 25th. And how do you feel about your team's ability to meet the challenge objectives? And this is not like a, you know, this is just to help us better understand where you're at right now. And I'm just gonna add. So for the for the check-in, I just shared um, while you're voting. I see uh, 
everyone is is into voting we have more and more votes every second so while doing that i also shared the link and um, i did send an announcement with it a while ago but i guess maybe some of you haven't seen the link so i'm just going to post it in um in the back in your participation space um in the participation form usually there's a text at the beginning which explains again the deliverables and so on so i'm just going to put the link right there so you have it um, and you can find it again on the platform if you need it and you want to schedule your meeting your check-ins um, later after the workshop or, or later today um, yeah okay great thank you lisa what would we do without you oh you you'll have somebody else who would do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true <laughs> Yeah, we have about, I don't know if you can see it, we have about 16 out of 25 people voted. I guess um, if we count, we, we're not gonna count um, all the speakers of so Frank, Emily, Anthony, and so on. So, so I guess we're, we're almost through with all the votes. Okay. And Lisa, once the voting is finished, would you just um, would be able to see the vote to see what everyone's response is? Yeah, I'm gonna share it. So I think great. Good. We have twenty votes now, which I think should be good. So I'm just gonna end the poll, and I'm gonna share the results with you. Okay, so everybody can see these results right now. Yes, okay, I can see it. Um, so it looks like majority is about 25 to 50% complete on the small building and the same on the big building. Um, majority have just started, um, are in the early stage, first quarter of progress on estimating costs. So I guess this is perfect because <laughs> we'll get a sense of, um, you know, where should go, you should go next. Um, on question four, where do you need help estimating costs? Looks like it's all spread around materials, labor, biggest one being transportation and logistics. Okay, so we can, we can definitely talk a little bit about that. Um, question five and six, uh, confident to meet team's ability, confident in meeting the deadline and the challenge objectives. About 85% are somewhat confident. Um, okay, I think that's a good, good gauge for us. So thank you very much. Uh, helps us to understand where you're at today. So um, I'm gonna go on to the next screen and hand it over to Allison. So just a reminder that um, we covered the costing template and it is available on the FAQ page of the website. Um, so just a reminder that we're not going to go over that in detail today, um, but um, I'll hand it over to Allison and she can talk to you about um, cost estimating. Thanks, Ian. Hi, everyone. Um, so for the cost template, I know when you guys went through it last time, I wasn't part of that meeting. And I'm guessing it was a little bit, um, you know, before you guys had started putting together proper estimates for this. So I just wanted to see if anybody had any questions on this spreadsheet and um, how it works and where to enter stuff now that you guys have started actually putting the cost together. And if anyone had any questions, just um, put it, your message in the chat. Okay, so we'll leave it at no questions for now. If you have any questions, please type it in the chat and then we'll address it at the, um, at the end of the discussion. Okay. So over to the next slide. Um, so just a couple of points about the, um, the estimating. So I know a lot of you are not from the, the local area here. So the biggest challenge is gonna be finding local costs. 
Um, so there's various ways that you can find costs around here. The, the best way to do it is to find uh, local trades or contractors who will actually do the work for you. So they will be able to look at the drawings and the information that you give them and give you a budget price for each of the different components of the building. Where it's going to be tricky is where um, new, you know, obviously new technologies are being used. So there's not a lot of um, contractors who are already doing that type of work. So in that case, you'll have to be building up costs based on, um, you know, your, your own kind of knowledge of what you're doing and research. So you'll have to build those costs based on the material components, which, you know, may be the concrete supply, your labor components, which is going to be, you know, how many people, like, for example, for the 3D printing, how many people are going to be required to, to be on site um, at how much per hour their their cost is and then the uh, equipment component is going to be a large portion of that so depending on what the you know the um, component is it's really important that you try to break down your costs as much as you can so that when we review the budgets coming in we can understand how you came up with those costs and whether or not they seem reasonable So the um, procurement and logistics. So the way that construction is done here is through a construction management approach. So you have one kind of construction manager who manages each of the individual trades, but each component of the work would be done by a different trade. So for example, you would have somebody doing the structure, somebody different doing your mechanical, someone different doing your electrical, somebody different doing, you know, the, the framing, if it was a, you know, a small house with whether it be wood or a different material. And then you would have different trades doing your interior finishes for the building. So your one construction manager is going to manage all of those different components. So that's procurement. Um, so logistics. So the other tricky one, and you guys all had comments on, um, you know, transportation and, and logistics of material. So the best thing to do to keep your costs efficient is to try and source things locally. As soon as you start sourcing products or materials that aren't local, there's going to be a bunch of different, you know, transportation costs and potentially exchange and imports and duties. And I think all of that is, um, not going to be in line with the one of the main objectives of this program is to be cost efficient. So I think it's it is really important that you try to source things locally here. Um, so the picture on the screen here of RS means this is a good tool to help you develop um, costing based on like labor and productivity. So RS means um, is very big in the in the US and there's location factors where you can switch the costs from you know wherever it it is to you know to Canada or different places in the US. But what they do have is um, a really good kind of components to to build up your costs. So for example, um, they have rates for crews, like a different crew for a certain um, set of work, like how many people you would need and what their productivity is. So you can figure out a very uh, precise labor costs. And then the material costs would be based on whatever you're finding locally. And then the equipment would be just based on what kind of equipment you need. But again, RS means has a lot of detail that you can determine what your equipment costs are. So building up unit rates like that is typically what the individual trades will do because they're the ones that are actually going to do the work. So the best way for you guys to try and get those prices is to reach out to local trades and see if they will give you a budget. Okay, so Alan, I have, uh, sorry, Allison, I have a dumb question. So sure. I'm a team that I've never, quoted or gotten any budget for any building before. I've never constructed a house. I've never constructed a building. Yeah. But where I have today is um, I have a drawing 
um, that my team prepared of my small building and big building. And it shows the dimensions, the walls. I'm gonna, I specified the materials. I'm gonna use, I don't know, say 70% concrete, 30% wood materials. Mm -hmm. And I have an estimate of the quantities of those materials driven from my design. So where do I go now? Um, do I take my drawing? Do I find what kind of person am I looking for at this starting point to get estimates for materials, labor and equipment? Um, so it depends. So each component is going to be a different a different trade. So for okay. example, if you have um, exterior masonry block, for example, or brick, you would need sure. to find a mason. Okay. So if I'm using brick, I'm finding a masonry person. What if I'm using concrete? What, what kind of person am I looking for? Uh, formwork trade. Formwork trade. Okay, yeah. so I'll, I'm going to Google formwork trade Ontario or something like that, and hopefully somebody will talk to me. So right. once I find that person, and let's say I'm building, my building is majority made out of concrete, and I find that formwork person, uh, again, this is just an example. So mm -hmm. what information do I need to give them in order, to, what do I need to ask them in order for them to give me a quote? Is it like, well, they would have to see, drawing? so they would have, they would likely have to see the drawings to see what, um, you know, the type of project and kind of what, what would be involved. Right. So a lot of times they will give you a cost per square foot of contact area of formwork. Right. But then in addition to that, you would need to determine the supply cost of the concrete, the supply cost of the rebar. If you're doing rebar. Okay, if you were, so. Yeah, if you were doing like traditional concrete, right? There's different components that go into it. So it's important to just ask those questions of what's included and what's excluded. Okay, so that's an example where I go to a formwork designer or, or, or builder and that explain, I'll give them my drawings. I'll say, this is the portion of my building that I want done in concrete. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give me a unit price and break it down? Like this, this is the quantities, this is uh, what the unit price is. This is how many people are gonna be involved mm -hmm. in, um, in doing that work. And they're gonna give me a quote yeah. for that work. And should I get just one quote or how many quotes should I get? Like how deep should I get? Um, you know, when you're, when you get to the point where you're procuring the project and you're going out to get firm, uh, you know, bids from people, you want to get at least three bids to make okay. sure it's competitive. I mean, at this point it's a budget. So if you could get at least two, that would be ideal. So that way, if the quotes are complete or the budgets are completely different from each other, you know, that something is, something is not right. Right. Because the budget yeah. could be right similar right yeah that makes sense and so how do I what am I looking for in terms of I don't know people in Canada I've never gotten quotes for building construction in Canada so what qualities am I looking for in those companies to know that they can do this job their experience so if you look at the contractors websites and see what type of projects they work on what area they work in you're generally going to be. Um, and you, we have we haven't decided on an exact location yet, correct? So I would suggest that you look for contractors within um, the GTA, so Greater Toronto Area. Okay. And that's going to give you a good starting point because the project will be built within you know an hour or two of the GTA. Right. <clears throat> okay. So that's an example for materials. If it's say concrete using traditional rebar construction methods. What about if I needed to hire a crane, like say as a piece of equipment, um, how do I do that? Is that, do I follow the same process for hiring a crane? Um, so the cranes are a little bit different. It depends what scope of work you're using it for. So a lot of times, so for example, with a big building, you would have the crane would already be there as part of the, formwork contract or if you okay. were doing precast concrete it would be part of their contract already and not necessarily a separate piece 
But if you okay. needed um, like a movable crane, for example, to install, um, you know, framing for a roof or something, that mm -hmm. would that would be a, a crane rental that you would have to carry the cost for as part of an overhead. Okay, so I would Google crane company or something. Crane rentals, yep. And what do I have to bring in order to um, get a quote from a crane company? Don't I have to be prepared? Like, I probably have to know what I'm lifting, the heights, dimensions, those sorts of things, um, so that you I need, can. Yeah, you would need to know what type of crane would be required and mm -hmm. how long you would need it for. Okay, okay. So the crane so rental is one piece, and then you need to determine who's going to operate that crane because the crane operator is a separate cost. Oh, so you mean I can bring my own crane operator or the craning company can supply their own operator? I, I don't know that the crane rental companies supply operators. You would have to have your own. If, okay. if I could interject, uh, Allison and Young, I mean, crane operators, I mean, I think it is, it's high, highly regulated in terms of safety, so. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be a person with the right certification. But That's right. The other part is things like the crane or, uh, and say construction hoarding, uh, what I'll call services around the site are typically provided by a general contractor. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, just as a suggestion, the person may be better to try and find a general contractor who seems to work on sizes of buildings similar to the one that you're proposing. And in their basket of services, they will be able to provide a crane and a crane operator um, and hoarding. But uh, the only way I've been involved in getting a large crane is through a contractor. I've, I've never directly been involved. Anyway, it's just sort of a context because I think it, it's pretty difficult for somebody to sort out, um, you know, hiring and operating. It's a very specialized task, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. So Tony, it sounds like you're recommending calling up a general contractor, somebody who is specialized in organizing building construction and say, can you help me source the crane part as an option? And while you're talking to them, there's other things you're going to need, like a fence or a hoarding. Um, and, um, you, you know, certain safety things to keep the site legal. Uh, the contractors are used to doing this. They do it every day. They have some of this equipment in their bat in their own lot. Um, you know, it's an efficient way, I would think, to get at. Uh, the, it's sort of a support service to your your basic construction. So a lot of times what we do when you look at the site overhead costs and the, the general contractor or the construction managers, um, you know, supervision costs, we just carry it as a percentage of the overall construction costs. Mm -hmm. Or we right. look at it on a monthly basis, how long is the schedule and what are the monthly costs going to be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Uh, another dumb question. So, Allison, you said that it's best to get at least three quotes for each item. Do you want uh, the teams, when we they submit that to, you know, at the end of the deadline, um, do you want three quotes or just the best quote? What What would you like to see? Just Just the best quote, whatever quote that they would be carrying within their budget. And is the best quote the lowest quote necessarily or is it the one that they think is the best encompassing kind of value so it's like the one that can do the best job at the best price it doesn't necessarily have to be the lowest price or, or what what, do you, what would you recommend not necessarily the lowest quote it's more important that it's um it includes everything right mm -hmm. 
So they need yeah. to just make sure that um, assumptions, uh, inclusions, exclusions, they're aware that it's all encompassing, right? Right, right. So um, if, all, if all quotes are given and they're all equal, then yes, you would generally want to go with the lowest. And, and, and then the other, sorry, Young, the other two things is obviously the time. Different suppliers may uh, respond with different time frames, so uh, that's relevant. And then this is where it's less a science, more an art. It's your feel of who do you think's going to be reliable to actually perform. And that's obviously difficult from a distance, but whatever you can learn from what you you know online or what you see by talking with people so it's really a combination of um doing your starting your research online then speaking with people getting quotes exchanging information about your design uh explaining what you're trying to do and then um getting quotes that you believe uh you'll be able to um uh, deliver your plan, finding people that will deliver your plan in the best possible way mm -hmm. at a good price. Um, so some teams I know um, are working on prefab. Um, so they want to do a combination of um, on-site or off-site prefab um, assembly. So Allison, what do you think, what would you recommend is the best way to approach this? Where do they start? Well, you would have to find somebody who would actually construct it for you. So an existing, um, you know, prefab facility that either makes what they're trying to achieve or makes something similar and see if they would be willing to work with you to make what it is that you're, you're prefabbing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a, an existing business entity, maybe they're already manufacturing something, mm -hmm. um, or maybe they're already in the business and they can carve out uh, a portion of their space for you, or maybe they can make this specialized part for you at the beginning to start, yeah. start, start off with. Right. Um, okay. Uh, Frank and Tony, do you have anything else to add uh, in that regard? Yeah, you know, I just want to clarify something. Uh, I think probably, as I was saying, the best place to find a crane is from a contractor. Um, but in this competition, we're, we've said in the end, we will provide the general contractor. So while I said he's got a package of services, you know, that include hoarding and other organizational things, um, I think the best is to follow Allison's suggestion of just have, you know, not trying to price the contractor directly, the general contractor, but just to put it under overhead with a percentage markup. Because in po point of fact, we're going to provide the general contractor in the end. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so going back on the last two points procurement and logistics um so some companies let's uh, say some companies or teams they have to bring in large equipment from overseas whether it's south america or europe or asia or africa um and um you know we've all kind of seen it like the suez canal right now for instance large shipping containers um, being transported overseas. Uh, so there's different methods of transportation. You can carry it by sea, you can carry it by air, you can carry it, um, I guess those are the two methods if you're going uh, cross-continental. Um, where does one start with um, estimating, I guess you, first you have to know what you're bringing over and what kind of a box it will fit in and the weights and dimensions of the box. Um, where do you start with trying to estimate if you have to bring in this large box filled with stuff that you need to have for your construction? Where do you start? So you would have to, like you said, determine, <clears throat> excuse me, which, which methods of transportation you can utilize. 
So if you're shipping stuff over in a C container, how much stuff are you shipping? Do they charge you by weight, by size? And then it's essentially getting quotes from shipping companies. Okay, so um, sounds like there are companies, transportation companies that just specialize on shipping and procurement. So you need to tell them, okay, I, I need to bring it from this location to this location. Um, this is what I can fit my equipment into. This is the size of box and container. I'm going to take responsibility for protecting my equipment inside. And all you have to do is bring it from A to B. Um, and then you can find a, a transportation company that will give you a quote um, mm -hmm. on that. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Um, and it's a lot, are, it's a lot of research, would... right? So it's, you know, you, you want to get this stuff done and you have to figure out how you're going to get it done. So building a proper estimate is just like, it's digging deeper, doing your research and, you know, finding the information. It's not right. always easily accessible, and there's a lot of research that goes into it. Right. And uh, it'd be important in this instance to work with um, a logistics company that has experience in importing to Canada, because you may bump up against uh, uh, import rules, duties, and taxes, and things like that. And you want to work with a company that has experience dealing with that red tape locally, right? Um, so that would be my advice there. So what are some of the questions that, I mean, aside from this is what I'm shipping and these are the dimensions and weights, what are some of the things that I have to answer, um, give information to these logistics and procurement companies, like these transportation companies? Well, I think, sorry, I was going to say, um, you know, the big challenge is time, getting things to show up when you want it. And so you have to figure out coordination. When you want it on site to facilitate other activities. And then, I mean, the Suez Canal is an unusual example, but <laughs> things can go wrong. Uh, you know, when you're moving things long distances or get delayed. So just make sure you build in contingencies of time uh, so you don't get caught waiting for something. Right, and then do I have to worry about things like oversized loads? So for instance, in some countries this applies, like in Canada, for instance, if we're transporting a giant box that's an unusually like big box. Um, I also have to worry about things like, you know, getting um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, a vehicle, like a police vehicle accompanying that or a safety vehicle to accompany that box. Mm -hmm. um, do I worry about that? Or is it the transportation and logistics company that will, will worry about that for me? It's, I it's your... can... Sorry, transportation and logistics companies, they will quote you a price to get it from A to B. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And anything that's excluded. So if they said, okay, it's an oversized load, which means you'll need a police escort. If that's not included in their price, they would typically list it as an exclusion. And then you would have to determine that price as well. Yeah. And they'll also, the logistics company will tell you um, if the uh, schedule is a problem with respect to uh, you know, road closures, right? Seasonal road closures, for example. There's weight restrictions that go into effect here in the province of Ontario in the spring, right? Um, they'll 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 tell you that oh, you can't ship that in um, you know in April, right? Because uh, because the roads won't won't accommodate it, for example. And the size and the size and the weight, they'll they'll tell you if it's um, if it's going to be a problem or not. Right. So if I was a contestant or a team, I could take a look at the calendar that we set out for building and construction of the small building to start off with and say, um, here is my calendar for delivery. Here's what I'm aiming for. So as soon as we receive a building permit, I will need to prepare to have this equipment on site and calculate backwards. Like this is when 
I need to start the delivery process and when it needs to arrive so that it can go in the whole sequence of construction. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, as, and, as, and as Tony suggested, if it's coming overseas, uh, you may want to allow a little bit of extra time for complications that may arise during transport, right? Like right. Right. the situation we saw with the Suez Canal. Right. And I, I was reading that the Suez Canal uh, issue right now is going to cause a cascading effect on global supply chains. Um, I know it's affecting Europe right now, wondering if it's, I'm just curious if it's gonna affect Canada or North America deliveries, um, but uh, it's something to consider. And um, yeah, and then, so we talked about overseas transportation. What about local transportation, like from city to city? So let's say I find a company that um, is currently manufacturing and is willing to work with me on this particular part. Um, I want to deliver it, um, let's say within less than 400 kilometers um, from the manufacturing facility to our construction site. Are there any unique aspects of delivery or transportation logistics that I have to think about? Typically, I whoever is manufacturing stuff, they're delivering it for you. Yeah. Everything, most most prices will say, um, they'll quote it FOB, which means like it's delivered to the job site. <clears throat> right. Right. Yeah, so when, 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 yeah, when, when Allison said, you know, review the quote for exclusions and inclusions, this is a good example um, of looking out for exclusions of a manufacturer saying, you know, a delivery to the site is by others, you know. Um, uh, so you want to then allow for that, right? Because you like the you like the manufacturer, you like their price, but I need to factor in now uh, a third party to do the delivery or the shipping because they won't, and, they exclude it. Yeah, out. that's typically not done. It's just like you order something yeah. from Amazon, they deliver it to you. You're not expected to go to the Amazon warehouse and pick it up yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I guess if I'm working with the manufacturer, I need to make sure that whatever I'm assembling on their site, when it's brought over to the construction site, that it stays in one piece and maintains structural integrity and all the important things to, to make sure that it stays together, that it's that's that's you know. generally their responsibility. So they would be responsible to manufacture it and get it to the site and have it in in good condition. Okay. I, I was just going to say the other reason um, it's worthwhile having the manufacturer do the transportation, even if he initially excludes it, seeing if you can convince him to do it for a reasonable price, is then he's responsible for it uh, being in proper condition when it gets to you. Um, okay. And then once it arrives on site, do I have to worry about things like how do I store it on site and where does it stay and all that kind of stuff and price that, it for storage? That's all your, um, you know, logistics and coordination, right? So the general contractor construction manager would be responsible to make sure that all the materials and whatnot are scheduled to arrive at the right times to one, not hold up construction and two, have the room to store it on site. So all the materials right. aren't necessarily delivered at the same time because there's not enough room to store everything on site. Depends on where your site is and how much ex, you know, extra room you have, right? What is your staging area like? Right. So I should also plan out my staging area for delivery and on-site assembly. Like there's well, that would be something that the area. construction manager or general contractor would do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think I have a good high level understanding of all these things. It seems like it's gonna be a lot of work still for me, but um, if I was a contestant. So tell me a little bit more about RS Mean. Um, is it something that anybody can use or how does it work? Um, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. I know you can purchase the books or you can purchase online subscriptions. So I'm not sure how much information is publicly available. Okay. Um, it's also, it's just, it's a guide. It's not actual firm costing. So I would use RS means like 
as a last resort if I couldn't get a budget from other sources. Okay. It helps you build a budget from scratch. Right. But, but it's sort of all sort of like a theoretical database. It's not theoretical, but it's sort of high level if you didn't really have it's better to get quotes or talk to people directly yeah, first. Absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> and then I guess you can always find RS means or other databases that are more free information, but it's not unique to your project. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's good for me. Um, or kind of pretending to be the contestant <laughs> asking questions. Um, I'm going to hand it over to, um, thank you, Alison. And I, I'll, I guess if, the, any members or any participants have questions, please put it in the chat and we can answer at the end. Or if you think about you're working on it and if you if you, you, you think of something, write us an email and we'll try our best to point you in the right direction. Um, so there is, sorry, Nyan, just back for one second. There was a comment that came in from Alex in the chat um, and it just says might be a good idea to provide typical pricing for this area of Ontario. Um, but it will be fairly challenging to get proposals from qualifying trades in the area where these buildings are going. So the problem is it's there is no there's, there's no such thing as typical pricing. Every project is unique and every project is different. If everybody was building the same type of building, it would be a little bit easier. But the whole goal of this challenge is to be innovative and do something new. And when you're doing something new, it's not necessarily typical. Yeah. So if the teams have, you know, specific questions on specific aspects of pricing, I'm happy to help along the way. But there is no kind of, uh, you know, one typical list that's going to work for every single team. Yeah, yeah, I, I do understand Alex's point. And I guess what Allison is saying and what we're trying to convey to you is that we're telling you what one method is, but we're also, we also want you to think about different methods to, to do this. So we don't want to give you all the answers. So, <laughs> okay, so um, Tony, can you talk to us a little bit about land contracts and all these other stuff that I've never heard of like these terms, what do they mean? Certainly, good day everybody. Uh, and I'm going to talk about these items that Nyung has listed up on the screen and I guess she's used this colorful umbrella to say this is to help protect you. Uh, certainly the contracts and the bonding does. Uh, all of these items, or let me say, none of these items are things you need to deal with for this contest, but uh, you certainly do if you're going to have a project separate from this. And so, you know, it's obvious you need land to be able to build. Now, buying land is the riskiest part of your investment if you're doing this at the start of a project before you have all your approvals in place and your drawings done and your contracts in. So to buy land, typically you have to generate or have the money or the capital yourself. Uh, an alternative is to lease the land. And, um, that's and frankly that's how our company was able to get started because at the start it it didn't we didn't have the money to be able to buy land so we leased land and the document that is used is what's called a ground lease and in this case the land is owned by one person or company and the building ends up being owned by a different company uh, and because you're leasing it, it's the land, it's like leasing anything, you don't have to put up the money to buy it. Uh, here, land leases are typically for long-term, 49 to 99 years. Uh, and the land rent is usually fixed for 25 or 30 years 
And then every 25 or 30 years, it gets revalued uh, loosely to either uh, protect the landowner for inflation or moves in market values of land. And the theory is that you as the building owner will be able to similarly raise or adjust your rent uh, in a, a new higher uh, environment that will allow you to keep going and uh, pay the uh, higher rent. Uh, they, um, it's uh, a document that used uh, a lot. Now to do this, you have to convince your landowner that you have a good plan and a good budget because he's going to be concerned that you'll be able to earn enough money to pay uh, his rent. But leasing land is a, uh, an excellent way to actually get control over the site and to use it. In, in many parts of the world, land really isn't available to purchase. The only way you can have a building project is to lease it. Here in Canada, uh, there's as much or probably more purchase and sale of land, sales of land than leases. My understanding of where ground leases came from is that many generations ago in England, the royal family was looking for a way to pass on their wealth to successive generations and yet protect the, these younger generations from blowing the money all at once. So they went out and created all these land leases where they tied up the money in long-term leases where they had a, a secure flow of money over the long-term, but the, the capital was tied up in the, in the land. Um, the, the next thing are contracts, and I want to talk about, and, you know, construction has been going on for a long time here in Canada, and in fact, in the world. So a number of conventions have evolved to protect, protect the actors who are involved in a building site and give predictability to the relations. So you have say you as the owner, you have the builder, you've heard us talk a lot about the general contractor, and he will have typically many subcontractors or sub trades. Uh, you have a municipality, you may have a bank. Um, and um, so you can see there's many uh, parties that get involved in a construction project and everybody's looking to protect their interests, but everybody is uh, mutually interdependent. Uh, so uh, we use a standard contract called the Canadian CCDC, which stands for Canadian Construction Documents Committee, which, you know, is a result of many years and many uh, participants uh, working on a document um, that that functions efficiently. The key part of the document is how you deal with changes and extra costs. Because what happens is no matter how well you plan and no matter how firm or tight your contract may be, um, invariably during the course of a construction project, somebody, either the contractor shows up and says, you know, the architect forgot to design this or he designed it in an impro excuse me, practical way, or the architect realizes there's a deficiency with the result that a change has to happen. So one of the key parts of the contracts is how that change gets uh, suggested, how it gets documented, how it gets committed, and, and different ways of pricing it uh, so everybody is protected. And um, it also uh, provides for a predictable way of settling disputes. In the first instance, uh, typically the architect is named in the contract as the arbiter, arbiter 
of disputes between the owner and the contractor. So you've got uh, a ready way of, of getting disputes settled. Um, and um, so the architect has to be strong enough, uh, you know, they, they have to have the right personal skills to uh, deal between contractors and owners. And then we have different types of contracts. There's the basic lump sum contract where you define the scope and the price at the start. This gives cost certainty to the owner, but uh, the challenge with it is if you need to make some of those changes I was just referring to, they tend to be expensive because now you're opening up what was a fixed contract. Some contracts or parts of contracts may be done based on a unit price basis where you agree on a price for quantities of material or volumes of concrete. Uh, the advantage here is you can get this type of contracted contract implemented fairly quickly, um, but again, you don't have price certainty. Uh, a variation of this is a cost plus, where the, the contractor opens his books and you agree, you'll just pay him whatever his costs are, plus an agreed upon percentage. And again, this has less, uh, it changes the psychology. Uh, it opens you as the owner up to extra costs, but now the contractor knows he's re removed his risk from the project and he's going to be less adversarial and more likely to come up with suggestions that help you uh, because he, he doesn't need to be as self-protective. Uh, but the challenge again is uh, you don't have overall protection. Uh, and another variation of this is what's called a time and materials contract where you agree on an hourly rate and a unit cost. And again, it's just like the cost plus contract. Uh, you can get the set up quickly uh, and you tend to, if it's the right contractor, get them to be thinking about your needs, but you're there without price certainty. Now you can if, have what's called a management contract where the contractor isn't contracting with the sub trades at all. And you're just paying him a fee, you know, an agreed upon dollar amount or percentage of where the construction is and the subcontracts, you know, the concrete, the carpentry, the doors, all those things are done in your name. You, only people who are very experienced would do that and in controlled circumstances. Um, again, it, it, the benefit here is you can make changes more efficiently and more cheaply uh, because you're not opening up a fixed contract, but as the owner, you're more exposed to the overall costs. Uh, one method and it's one we've used as a kind of a hybrid where at the start, we have a construction manager, we bid all the uh, sub trades bid to us directly. And then once, so we've maintained um, the flexibility to make changes, but once we've picked all the sub trades, we then roll them all together and give them, and it's understood beforehand that this will happen. And then we give all those, that contracts to the general contractor. And now when we start construction, we hopefully uh, nailed down fixed costs for our project, but we've kept open the flexibility for changes uh, to a much later stage than you would normally do. Uh, and now I want to talk about bonding and liens and insurance. And so, as I said before, there's many parties uh, on a, a construction project. 
and everybody's holding hands and everybody's interdependent. Uh, and I'm going to talk first about bonds. So what a bond is, is a promise from a financial institution that if your contractor or one of his subcontractors go broke and then stop showing up for work on the project or worse, stop showing up for work and you pay them to buy some materials, that the bonding company will then provide the money to finish the project, buy the materials, find another contractor. And this happens uh, very quickly and can happen seamlessly because you as the owner need to keep your construction project going, need to maintain the coordination uh, that's essential to the success. Uh, if you have a bank loan or a construction loan here, the banks will insist that you have a, a bonding on the project. And this is in effect like a line of credit that the general contractor will take out. Uh, he'll charge you a fee of say one or 2% and uh, he will provide the bond for the project. And to get a bond, you have to, the construction company has to be financially strong enough that the bonding company is confident that if they pay out on a bond, they can go get their money back from the contractor. But you can see everybody is uh, interdependent here. Liens are a regulation from the government to make sure workers are protected. You know, what they are, uh, not wanting to happen is workers show up to work, they work on the building, so the benefit of their service is now on site. They can't take it back. It's not like repossessing a car. How do they get paid? So there's a system that involves liens that if you don't pay your contractor uh, without reason, you know, there could be disputes and that gives you reasons not to pay. But if there's no agreed upon reason for withholding payment, uh, the contractor is obligated, he can and is really obligated by the government to put a lien on your property. And a lien is like a mortgage. This sits in front of the bank loan. I think it probably sits in front of realty taxes. So it is uh, stands first in front of all the securities that may be on your property. And so that then says, uh, you know, the, the project, uh, that amount of money is reserved to pay the workers or for the contractor to pay his bills, which includes paying his workers. Uh, and the way the bank loans work is if there's a lien on the project, the bank will stop immediately uh, funding the project. So liens get everybody's attention uh, because everything grinds to a halt. Now, if you still have an ongoing dispute with your contractor, you can get the lien removed from the title to the property by paying the dollar amount into court and then it sits there for the number of years until you get the court to settle it. But then the bank will continue funding and your project can carry on. But you as the builder have now funded something you may think you shouldn't have had to fund. and You're going to have to wait for the resolution. Uh, all, what all this does is it forces everybody to very quickly, like within days, to negotiate realistically uh, to keep the progress going and, and sort that out. Uh, so it keeps everybody honest. Uh, and, you know, in bank loans, one of the things they're doing is they're checking the title. Uh, a typical construction loan will have a monthly draw. So before they advance this, uh, that month's funding, they check the title in the registry office for the property, 
specifically to make sure there's no liens there in front of them. Uh, and to the last item uh, is insurance. And this is uh, very specialized um, um, because again, you have many parties uh, who are interacting. You have the contractor, you have the architects, you have the engineers, you have the owner, uh, you have the municipality. And uh, so if there's a problem, you have to get through the finger pointing because the contractor is going to say, you know, your architect or engineer made a mistake and they're going to say exactly the opposite. And you need to have a very knowledgeable, strong insurance advisor or insurance broker who's experienced in understanding um, where these conflicts arise and how to settle them. Uh, you have to, again, to get a bank loan, you have to have proper specialized property insurance to protect the building in case of physical damage, and also in terms of liability, if you hurt uh, people or damage uh, other, you know, thinking of neighbors' properties. Uh, again, uh, this is an industry that's been around for a long time. There's known practices. Nobody really in any of these things, in the bonding or the liens as well, nobody has to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you get a, uh, an experienced insurance broker, or there's special, you know, there's today there's specialists for any everything, lawyers who do nothing but construction lien, uh, and they all make this process very efficient. Um, you know, this tends to come into play more on larger projects than smaller projects, but the legal. Uh, liabilities and responsibilities uh, tend to be, or not tend, are the same. And uh, again, on in this contest, you don't have to look after this, but uh, this is just for purpose of your interest or enrichment. Okay. And so, if there's any question. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Tony, I, I have one question, I guess, before we go on to the next slide on behalf of the contestants. So in this whole symphony of people moving parts and, you know, all these risks and things that can go wrong, um, what will be the relationship of the finalist teams to um, the Marco Polo team or the sponsor? Um, what will be the relationship between the teams that make it to the finals and the sponsor? And how will they be protected from all of the stuff that you talked about? So uh, we're going to have a general contractor. We're going to be, in effect, the owner and the participants. Um, and I can't remember if they're a consultant to us or they're a subcontractor to the general contractor. Uh, and so it's, it, you know, it's in one, one of those, wearing one of those hats. Okay, so there'll be sort of, um, there'll be an entity that's working under the umbrella of the sponsor. Um, and so they don't have to worry about all these aspects, you know, leasing or land is taken care of. Um, the sponsor will structure the contracts. So if the contestants get quotes from suppliers and we think, that, you know, let's go with these guys, the sponsor will enter into contracts with the suppliers that the contestants chose and all the bonding, liens, insurance, will be provided for by the sponsor. So the contestants ultimately don't have to worry about those things. It's really just to um, find and source the people that they'd like to work with for their supply chain. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it may not be us directly. It may be our general contractor. Right, so either it'll be the sponsor or the sponsor's general contractor who will 
enter into those relationships. So it's, yeah. it won't be the contestants directly. And right. insurance uh, will be provided for if there are legal um, issues, it'll be resolved for by the sponsor and you know the orchestra people that exist to support the design. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, for the final slide, we just wanna to talk to you a little bit about what's coming up. Um, we know that you're only halfway through your design and you're probably going through all the weeds right now for sourcing and supplies and final details for your small and big building. So right now we are in block number one, which is, um, can't believe we started this just in January and your submissions are due May 25th. Um, and so as soon as you make the submissions and Lisa will create a detailed checklist and template for you so that when you uh, make your submission to ensure that the submissions are as complete as possible. So do your best um, to make the submissions as complete as possible. And the onus is on you to demonstrate to us that your design is realistic and feasible and make us excited about your design and make us want to build this. We, as you can see throughout this whole process, I hope we've really conveyed that we where we, you know, we want to build these designs. We are interested and excited about innovation. So convince us that your idea is the idea that we should go with. Um, between May 26th to June, June 11th, we're going to take 20 designs and um, shortlist the best 10. So very quickly, um, this will separate the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. And we want to take the top 10 submissions and we'll do a detailed review. So with that, we're going to do cost analysis. Um, you're going to create a budget. We're going to look at your budget and um, do our own assessment of whether we agree or, or, or maybe there's some things that we need to think about or question for your costs, your design. Um, we're going to have a code consultant review your submission to determine its compliance with OBC, Ontario Building Code. It's not a showstopper, again, if you're not 100% compliant, but we do want to understand how far off um, we need to go in order to meet compliance, because this is in a critical part of the, the competition. And as a small point, um, some teams are one or two individuals, some teams are larger. Um, this is your choice, the team's choice, but if we see that there are some benefits in merging teams because some teams have strengths that um, may complement uh, other teams with other strengths, we would recommend that you consider coming together as a single team, but again, it's up to you. Um, and then between June and August, so essentially as soon as we receive your submission, um, we're going to be doing detailed due diligence, so we really want to dive into your design, your cost, your quotes, um, all the stuff that you submit to us, and um, we may choose to interview some or all of the 10 teams, the shortlisted teams, and then a, by sort of the, probably mid-August, we expect to be choosing the top five teams that will be offered um, to proceed to stage three. And we have been doing a lot of preparation for stage three. Um, in that stage, as you know, we wanna take your design, we will have to massage it um, and work with you to adapt it to the local building, uh, building permit um, uh, office and what their requirements are. So do expect that um, the design is not going to be set in stone. It will have to be adapted to the local, the, the, the entity who's giving the, uh, the building permit. And in that process, um, our architect uh, will work with you and work directly with the five teams um, to, to take you through that process to basically realize uh, your vision or, or your concept, your building concept. Um, so with that, that's the end of our presentation for today, and I'll leave it up to anyone if you want to ask any questions, please send it in the chat um, and hand it over to Lisa. Great, thank you. 
Um, so, yeah, as Nu was saying, if you have any questions, um, that would be great. You can, well, just let us know, ask them now. You can just put them in the chat. I don't see anything coming up. So I, I think we went quite in detail and Nguyen, you asked a lot of good questions for, for the team. So I think uh, everything should be clear. Um, also, as you know, I'm saying that every time, but you can ask us questions in the, in the chat on the platform, as well as during your individual check-ins. So now you have the link to the individual check-ins on the platform, as I, as I said. Um, I added it um, during our workshop, so you can find it and book your, your check-ins um, to talk individually about your projects and ask more specific questions. And then also this video, um, I'm going to be posting it on the, in, the resources, um, um, in the resources on the platform, so you can watch it if maybe you missed the part or you want to rewrite and, and watch the, the explanations from Alison or, or the other speakers today. Um, yeah, so with that, I think there's not much left to say, just uh, as this is probably the, the last time in a while that I'll be seeing you. I'll still be in touch on the platform, but uh, I just wish you best of luck with your submissions. And of course, also, um, well, good, um, a lot of success with your, with your inventions. And hopefully I will see you again in, in other presentations, in other meetings. Okay, thank you so much, Lisa. And um, thank you to Allison, our special guest today, um, for giving us that briefing. It was a very high level briefing. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Okay, Bye. thank you. Bye. Bye.